I'm not here recruiting for the daughters and sons of the Confederacy, <laughs> but this is what I grew up with. I'm from Georgia originally, a small town in a rural area. And this, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, they, this is right outside the court, uh, courthouse. Yeah, they have, a, they, they have this giant tall mural, I mean a memorial to a Confederate veteran. They have a smaller one for World War I and another one for World War II. I don't think they have v Vietnam at all, but this kind of suggests what their priorities were for heroes. This was right outside of town. They have them all around town. And they have more churches there than they do people. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a message from their churches. This is what I grew up with. It's real, it's extremely conservative there. Uh, this is why I do a lot of the kind of things that you'll see. I did this one when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, I think. And, um, oh, is that in pencil, Greg? Yeah, just pencil, and it's freehand. Piece of paper about this big, and uh, we had bought a uh, a horse that was uh, um, from a man that raised Tennessee Walkers. I think he wanted to get rid of us because this was one of the meanest horses in the world. <laughs> she tried to kill several of us. Oh. And then, if you are going to be an artist, you need somebody that will take care of some of the things that you can't do. And I can't do much of anything, and I can't remember anything anymore. Probably some of you might know what that's about. This is um, a working uh, in the studio. I just want to uh, give you a sense of the size. There's still, you can see the rendering on the piece on the right side, it's fairly care carefully rendered in parts of it, but that's, I've always done that in a lot of ways. And then the left side's pretty loose. This, and that uh, painting is in, and that's in oil, um, and this is in the Gallery Fritz in Santa Fe right off the railroad tracks, and um, it's a beautiful gallery, and I'm glad to be in that I've been in there for Oh, in this past year. There are <coughs> two versions of this painting. This is the darker one. The other one is the, the one with the red background. But when, when I was a kid, my dad built uh, little paddle boats. We lived on a farm that had a pond, and we spent our summers just blazing around in the boat. But this was uh, the darker version. When you've lost the paddle, beyond reach, the boat's upside down, mm -hmm. and you don't have words anymore for yelling for help. <laughs> That's what that's about. This is the more joyous version, going home. I, I was thinking about that, uh, about being, it being summer recently, and, and um, my dad's been gone for about 10 years or so, and I was thinking about it would be fun to make a boat like he used to do. He, he could do anything electrical, just anything. We kept Carol's dad with us for three and a half years. He was a lawyer, he taught law, pardon me, and just one of the brightest, most articulate guys. He went to Yale or Harvard, one of, the, one of those. But he had stroke-related dementia, and I hope none of you have to go through that, because it's really tough for him and, and for us too, because he, they become somebody else. And he, that's what happened. And this character, the woman character, is kind of the role that Carol played in the relationship. And, and, um, and the, the word salad over there is kind of what, his, what language for him became. And he was one of the most articulate people in the world. But, and he did never talk, in, talk gibberish, but he would go from being a child in Ohio to being stationed in Hawaii in World War II to teaching law and then back and forth any number of times during a day. Oops. Oh, I'm trying to go back one. Okay, well, this could almost sum up my 
philosophy of life. Uh, being human is not even probably is not easy. And I, did I misspell easy? No. <laughs> I found one up more I did. <laughs> this is a painting that I did during the period when George Bush was getting us into war in the Middle East. And <laughs> as articulate as he was, he kept referring to the pe people that lived there as evildoers. And um, in the right, the religious right was all for him and for going to war. And I grew up oftentimes in my hometown a block away or even across the street from the First Baptist Church uh, social club and um, they were all, they fought tooth and nail to prevent integration and uh, there was always this, and, and probably every single one of them had any number of guns in their homes so it was real common um, This is a piece um, that I did for um, a show for Mariposa Gallery. And um, Liz has represented me for 10 years, probably at least. And this was a woman I call the Queen of Spain. She was, uh, I was working at one of the copy places, enlarging an image to put it on the canvas. And she was, she was totally coherent. And she, um, we were working across the little work, space, work uh, area for half an hour or more, 45 minutes. And, but I realized pretty quickly on, she, though she was coherent and she was articulate, she was also not making any sense. She, was, <laughs> she, she said she had been in the Air Force as a helicopter pilot and because she was her mother's favorite, her siblings had joined together to get her kicked out of the military. And it kind of went on that, in that vein. Uh, interesting. She was very polite. She was not scary. Scary, we go, now we go to scary. This had to do with, I worked at the newspaper, by the way, for 10 years, and I've always loved to read. And I'm, my wife and I, she worked at the newspaper longer than I did. And um, we're still news junkies. And this whole thing, and because I grew up in the South, which is a gun, has a real gun culture, um, and saw the white power people, and um, it's been just really upsetting that there are these people that will at random want to go into a place, and especially a religious place, and just start shooting people. This piece is called Shoot Them Down and Stack Them Up. Um, this is the time when it's appropriate to um, play next. Technical difficulty. Try it again. Okay. Shuffle. There's a, a pop-up screen um, box that has play, pause, next, back. What, what happens? Do I hit the arrow? Next. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I don't know what she did, but I, I'm glad. Uh, this is a piece that I had in Mariposa, too. I did, I did it for myself, and I really always loved music. And uh, I love crows too, they're real common in the South. And so I put the two together and uh, I thought, well, if crows were gonna do anything musically beyond what they can already do, they would probably play guitars. And that's, you know, I love that piece, I really do. I, I think the tones are all real rich. And, and then the areas where I left it simple, I, I really like that as well. That could have, you know, could have been done in pastels, but it wasn't. This is a piece, once again, about the militarization of the church. Um, I'm, like I said, I grew up across the street from the First Baptist Church several times and uh, saw them, like I said, fight 
integration, which they did pretty successfully, well past when civil rights legislation was passed. Um, they still had not integrate, integrated my school. In fact, they hadn't integrated it until the year after I left, believe it or not. It just seems unreal. But they were all into guns and violence. And this is a piece I did about the same kind of shooter, once again. Um, they're toxic, toxic people. Once again, I know it's ugly. It's an ugly piece, and it's about an ugly part of society, unfortunately. I wish I didn't even have to do this. I wish everything were really nice and pleasant, but it's not. Uh, that's a piece I did earlier on about, in a way, about the breakdown of a lot of social norms, societal norms. It's almost a requirement that everybody have at least one divorce, maybe, maybe a handful. This was about what I felt like. This is um, showing now at the gallery up in Santa Fe Gallery Fritz, owned by Deborah Fritz. It's right off the railroad track. And I felt like this is kind of our, a portrait of our country right now. Almost everybody I, that I know is practically, you know, seeing a psychiatrist for their depression. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, I'd always drawn, and I'd, my dad worked with wood all the time, and he even carved a few little things when we were growing up. And I always liked carving wood. And I, at one point, when I got real tired of, or kind of, not tired is the right word, but I needed to loosen up, and I needed to do something physical. So I started carving stuff again. This was one of the pieces. The, and it, the show was at Mariposa. That one's about my, my bad sleeping habits. My dog and I, uh, one of our dogs, uh, needs to get up in the middle of the night to go out. And she wakes me up. She comes in and paws me until I open the door and let her out. But it also corresponds to my need to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> it kind, of, kind of works out. But it, uh, it makes for a strange day as well, you know, when you have to take a nap in the middle of the day. And this is, this is a, a, I, I like images with devils. Um, that's our bad side. I don't believe in literal devils. Um, but I believe in phys fi figurative devils, and this is a friendly devil. I think I, probably most of us would like him or her. He's a him. Yeah, he's got a beard. Now, the next part, uh, anybody who is... Um, well, the next part's about prison, the ride in Santa Fe. And I was working at the paper when that happened. Right after it happened, I, uh, I was at the newspaper. And we were getting reports every single day about things, and the photographers would bring in, were bringing in photographs that would curl your hair. It was truly horrendous, and I, it just hit me like a, a ton of bricks uh, because there were a lot of parallels between prison life and the time I spent in the army. Uh, I was drafted during the uh, Vietnam era. I didn't go to Vietnam, thank God, but there's a lot. There are a lot of parallels, unfortunately. Um, it's an all-boys all club, rigid hierarchy, arbitrary, a lot of arbitrary stuff, bad food, um, <laughs> confined to certain areas. The, he was the man that came in after the ride. They, they kicked out the older um, guy that was in charge, and they put this new man in charge. He only lasted a couple of years. I, I did a series of drawings when it happened. They almost did, did themselves. They were on little pieces of paper like this big, and, and um, I had a copy of the Attorney General's report. Jeff Bingerman, Bingerman was the Attorney General, and he did a comprehensive report laying out the characters' names and how everything happened. It was only 36 hours, I think. And um, I, I was just just glued to the thing. And um, 
and anyway, I, I did a whole series of drawings that the museum bought. And um, those were some of the first ones. Uh, the, this, um, you'd think Nazis in today's time, but we've seen marches now with people still enamored of the, uh, of the Nazis. But gang membership was, was important back then, and it still is actually in prisons. One of the causes was overcrowding. And if, if all of us were in a, in a room or in a closet, you know, a quarter this size, by the second day we'd be pretty fed up with each other. And, and if we were torment, tormented, and, it, and if we had access to weapons, which they make, um, it would get pretty hairy, and that's what happens with prisons. If you want to try it, uh, just go rob a bank or something. <laughs> but when, you, when your home base is a, a very uncomfortable bed, um, anything can happen. They, they would have fights over the radio station that somebody's playing, and you could get killed. You go over and change somebody's radio station, and they might want to kill you. Hope's lost. You don't. You know. You you know. You're going to be there for a certain amount of time. And a lot of the guys. And this seems real sacrilegious, and I don't intend it that way. What I'm trying to show is what they dealt with. And a lot of guys grew up in families where, when they got arrested and got sent to the prison, they had a family reunion. And they were born with an attitude that they were born to lose. Uncle Jim's already in prison. Uncle Bobby's already in prison. So that's, that's the kind of attitude a lot of them, Carol, Carol's looking at me saying, hurry up with this prison stuff. <laughs> anyway, if, if anybody was really interested in this, this, which I am, and I don't expect all of you guys are, in fact, Nobody would hang this in their living room, I'm sure. <laughs> and a lot of things I've done, actually, I don't, I don't, I know that nobody would put them in their living room, unless you're a very special kind of a art person. <laughs> but, Adolf. Yeah. Um, but it, what I wanted to show, this this kind of work should be in a museum, I think, uh, because the same conditions that caused that riot still exist. We're still having lots of problems with prisons, and now especially that we've privatized a lot of it, it's even worse. And if I had time, I could tell you how the prison riot started. You'd just, you'd just be startled. It was so simple. But anyway, these are the kind of attitudes that ha happened that were common among one of the first things that they did that allowed them to take over a lot, a lot of parts of prison is they found a pistol. It was a flare gun. This one, I'm glad there are no children here, um, but this character, and it's not uncommon, has the Virgin of Guadalupe tattooed on his back, and that's supposed to buy him protection against being sexually assaulted. Prison life. Greg, what are you using? What paint are you? Is that? I mean, how do? Yeah, actually, I I did the draw the original drawings, oftentimes with um, just a marker. And then I would scan that in, and then print it out, and then I in the, like the uh, kind of kind of uh, pea green color, I put in in the computer. And then I could change it. I love working on the computer that way because I can just quickly knock out shapes. Mm. Then I can change it, the color a hundred times. Mm. And, um, and it allows me a huge flexibility and I really like that. But yeah, when the, one of the things that happened, once they gained control of certain parts of the prison, they made for the, for the pharmacy, of course. And then they were just throwing drugs down left and right scary as could be, and that's when the, and the, the hit the fan, you can imagine. This is that piece 
a piece that's um, that I did about this was in the 90s when the, the white power movement was big prior to this version of the white power movement and it followed on the trail of the civil rights era when they were really big which followed on the tales of the the ending of the civil war and that followed on the tail of the run up to the civil war is that then in pastels that one is in pastel uh, thank god we got, finally got to something that's pastel <laughs> yeah it's pastel and i work with carbothello pencils on um stonehenge paper um and i i uh paul was saying that he never put hardly any um spray fix on but i must have sprayed this one 20 times in in the development of the final piece um, but part of it is because you guys probably a lot of you guys work a lot looser i've worked loose before but i when i was doing the illustration i, I really felt like i couldn't and and um, when i finished the drawing i wanted after that one last little uh bit of color i wanted to put a a quick spray fix on it, box it up, take it to FedEx, and it's gone to to the east or west coast uh, the next day. It'll be there. That used to be my routine, but um, I did this um, on my own, not for a project. And uh, it's been shown at a number of places, and it's being being shown now <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> at Gallery Fritz. It was out on the floor, but I think it was a little too scary for everybody, so they put it in the bathroom. But I have to say, it's not the first time that I've had a piece that ended up in the bathroom. <laughs> and I, I really know that a lot of the subject matter I deal with is not pleasant. It's really not. And it's not, it's not intended to be. It's, there should be a learning component uh, to it. Um, Um, the Klan. Um, I remember when I was a kid, and we lived in Atl we moved to Atlanta, and we were driving down the freeway, and I saw this big. I was probably nine years old, ten. There was a big file of cars coming our way on the freeway, and it was all these guys in sheets. And we asked Dad, "What? What is that? That's the Klan. Their headquarters was in the in Stone Mountain." And uh, the, they were all over the place. This one was from World War II, and I was just horrified. I, I read a book by a well-known Jewish uh, philosopher, writer, uh, expert on World War II, and she wrote about, uh, in a, there was a death camp, and one of the officers was killing people. And of all things, he got tired of killing people, and he had to take a smoke break. This was in her book, and it was is a true event. And I was thinking, oh my God, how can anybody? How could that happen? I, this is human beings. It floored me, obviously. And this is about the, once again the connection between religion and and violence, and how I mean most. Probably most religious people here would say, "Well, there's no religion in my, uh, no violence in my church," but it's real common. Think of the, the, the what's the period when the Catholic Church uh, attacked the, the Inquisition? And uh, yeah, that too. But when they, when they went and attacked the Middle East, the Crusades, the Crusades yeah. Um, and, and so, and then we. I mean, who are we fighting right now? People that are motivated, do, people who are doing random killings in the name of religion. So if you're religious, I hope you're, I hope you're not violent, <laughs> especially toward me. I got real interested in war and I got really interested in hate. What, you know, what's all that all about? Can't we solve things in a, in a more peaceful way? This was about um, a George Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, it was a huge, huge, huge gamble. Uh, the, the river was essentially frozen. 
they not only took troops, the Hessians were on the other side, and they were, they just knew that George and his troops were not going to cross the river. And they were getting drunk over there and celebrating. And um, he said, well, now's the time to go. And they, they took men, and I think a thousand or more, horses and cannons on boats crossed that river. And they attacked the Hessians who, were, who had their guard down. And it was a successful attack, but a huge, huge risk. He could, all of them could have turned over their boats and drowned. This, I did this one when we had Carol's dad with us. And, and he, like I said, he had, he had stroke-related dementia, which I sort of felt like was kind of like this big thing on his back. And the thing about Carol's dad is he, if you ask, had asked him, and he was, like I said, really bright. Do you, do you have anything that's bothering you? Or do, do you feel like you carry any kind of a load? He, he would have said, because of the, the dementia, no, I don't, think I, I don't think there's any problems. It was, it's heartbreaking. It's truly heartbreaking. And I, I know probably a number of you might have had parents go through that. It's, it's, just, it's just so difficult. Well, since I worked at the newspaper, everybody, of course, loved typewriters. And some, I have had even several friends that had collectors of old collections of old typewriters, which are, I think they're just beautiful. But every, every writer needs their cup of coffee, they need their paper, and they need their typewriter. They don't need any more, of course. Nobody uses a typewriter. I did a lot of illustrations. Now we're getting into, uh, that last one was done in pastel, by the way. So is this one. This was for, I did an, an original version of this for a computer magazine. And you think, I think, why are they hiring somebody that works in pastel to do an illustration in a computer magazine? <laughs> but they did, and I didn't like particularly their idea. So I redid it and added these other characters in there. I thought it just computer uh, imagery is real fun. But what was the story about? Their story was about I can't even remember anymore. All of this, all of the illustration stuff. I, I finished all that years ago. Um, but it was just about the kind of rollicking. You know, anything goes in circus. Everything is theatrical. It's way you're way over the top, and multiple things going on at once. You know, your fire eater, your strong man, the clown, the music. It was just fun, <laughs> and I did. Now I'm getting into the music thing, but this is also pastel, <coughs> and um, I did a lot of stuff for um, uh, Tom Brownick's. Um, jazz workshop and um, when I was doing those I, I was thinking also about when in New Mexico's earlier history like there were a lot a lot of people played musical instruments and I, I was thinking well where do they get them anyway you know if you don't if you only go to town once a month um, because you went on a horse and buggy. If you were in northern New Mexico in one of those tiny little towns and you want to go to Santa Fe to buy a guitar or something, either you made one or, you know, maybe that one time a month you went to Santa Fe and bought a guitar, but mu music itself was still there. And in fact, northern New Mexico is, is really pretty famous for music. And I, and I love all that. And I love the New Mexico uh, landscape. Oops. Well, I was thinking about jazz, um, and I was thinking about a children's book. Carol and I worked on a children's book that never got uh, printed. Um, but I was thinking about jazz now in New Orleans, and I was thinking, well, if what if jazz was invented in New Orleans? Well, I mean, why jazz was invented in New Orleans? But what if it was invented not by people but by animals? That was kind of fitting for a children's book. And my choice would have been a frog. It would have been a frog. Because <laughs> they like to jump around and jazz has that as a, this was a, for a financial magazine. 
And uh, I thought, once again, one of those perverse ideas uh, that a financial magazine would be calling on, on me to do projects. I can't even balance my, my <laughs> monthly bank account. Uh, and this was about financial companies keeping creative ideas in the air. You have to keep things certain. You want to keep track of your clients' money, but you want to keep creative ideas alive still. I think that's what their story was about. This one, a friend of mine was the, uh, the art director of a Catholic magazine, and I'm not Catholic, um, but he, was, he, he really was, and he's a firm believer, and I really liked him. He also could draw, and he, he called me from California, and he said, I got an idea. He said, I'll send it to you. And he, he did a, a rough little sketch that had the two characters, and, and it sort of had the, the two characters that, that were painted in, on the backdrops. And um, he just gave me the whole idea, and, and this piece actually almost did itself. And I really liked it. I thought it was fun, and it was dealing with circus or, or carnival stuff. And uh, the little lady kind of looks like my mother's mother. The cursor's down there in the bottom. <laughs> oh, okay. This was for the Santa Fe Opera, the back scene part of the opera. Um, you know, they, they have the construction crew, they have the sound crew, costumers people that paint scenery, they have, you know, carpenters, they, and then they have the, the person that's out front is a, the opera singer. But um, they kind of gave me a, a synopsis of what I was to deal with, and, and this is what I came up with. I really liked it. How large would that be? How large? Um, Size? It's probably about this. Uh, when I was doing an illustration, I made things a, a consistent size because I would was able to package up everything and send it off FedEx easily, and uh, so I tended to make things a certain size. This is a thing I did for Communication Artists of New Mexico. It was, a, it was an illustration, photography, uh, design group, and they. They just asked me if I wanted to do a poster. I said, yeah, that'd be fun. And I thought, well, cowboys are pretty serious about, quote, cowboying. Um, but I lived on a farm, and we had a little Brahma when we got him. He was about this big, and his ears were almost to the ground. And within a year, he was this big. And he was, he was still like a dog. He was like a pet. And I saw Brahmas, not like the rodeo Brahmas that are trying to kill somebody, but just this big pup, overgrown puppies almost. Mm -hmm. This is a book I did about the Beatles, and it's a what if book. And the author said, well, what if they had not come together like they did successfully? And what if the two main characters didn't like each other? In fact, they didn't like each other a lot of times. <laughs> And you see one of them's, uh, what's the, the prettier uh, Paul, guy in the front? Paul. Paul. <laughs> He's got his hand in front of, of uh, John. George. John. 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 Sorry, I do know him, but I, I can't remember names. But uh, they resisted, fought tooth and nail with their manager to keep from putting those suits on that they ended up being famous for. Uh, you know, with the tight pants and the whatever shiny. Uh, fabric, and um, John wanted to be Elvis, <laughs> and he, want, he was a fighter. He liked to get drunk and get in fights in bars, and they were all very different, and the, the book sort of carries that to an extreme, uh, saying, you know, what if, what if they, what if? It's, it was an interesting book, and it was a fun project. This was... There was a company that did audio books. They would have a text. You could buy the book, uh, smaller books, I think. But they had them on tape. 
and this was one of them. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but it was, they were all mysteries. And uh, so to make it mysterious, it was, it was um, situated in Nashville. And to make it mysterious, I put the, uh, the, the dice in the sky and put the planet there too. This one was in, I can't remember the name of the Mac, Utney Reader. Um, and it was, a, they mentioned actually Taco Bell. <laughs> I changed it, changed it to Burrito Hell. And what they were doing, they were hiring, and they still do. You can, you can tell if you go to one with any regularity, you can tell, you never see the same people behind the counter more than a couple of times because they hire young people that had no experience in working. And they, they, they pull a lot of tricks on them. They, they, they say, if there are no customers in here right now, you don't get paid. And they would say, they would make them work overtime and they wouldn't pay them for that. And they just had a lot of, they got sued and they, they got in a lot of trouble. But, um, and then this was about that same kind of idea, but at an international level. Uh, a lot of countries in the world, especially in the Middle East, were uh, um, Saudi Arabia were bringing in workers from Africa who, who only had skills in manual kinds of work, and they would lock them up into contractual bindings that they couldn't get out of almost. And they were they were even if they could have hired a lawyer, of course they couldn't hire a lawyer. But they, they would not have been able to get out of, out of it very easily. And this one, I did the original version of this for a magazine and they, they wanted me to do something about a particular politician. I think he was Italian. And I finished it and it had most of the same things. Um, but I, I thought, well, I don't like that it has a politician's face on there. I drew him accurately, but I thought, well, this is really not fun. Nobody but nobody that, that didn't know that guy would care about that drawing, even though I think it has some fun things going on, but I thought it'd be a lot more fun if it had a devil. <laughs> so I put a devil in there. Because devils are going to fight cultural things. All the bad people are going to fight cultural things. They, they hate books. They hate things of the heart. They hate the, the arts. So I, I thought this was a lot more fun. And I just did this one for fun. I love those little, uh, either BGs or GBs, I can't remember. They're, they were racing airplanes that were popular in the 30s and 40s. And they used to race airplanes. And uh, this one was very unstable, um, but it was fast. They had a huge motor. And uh, they would win if you didn't get killed, you know. But there was a there was a fair chance you could get killed because they were unstable. Then more more carnival stuff. And that previous piece was pastel, by the way. This uh, carnival stuff. And I I had some friends that knew the man that did. Carol, what's the name of the place on on the back road to Santa Fe? Tinkertown. Tinkertown. He, did, he made a living painting those backdrops. And I thought, well, what a fun idea. And, uh, and the, the, of course, the images that are in the backdrops are all way over the top. They're just, you know, crazy. You know, the people with three heads and four arms. And, and uh, this one is half woman, half snake. And I thought of the guy. I never met him, but I knew a lot of people that, met, that did know him. He wasn't at all like this. Um, my wife said, that's more like me. And, and, and I, hope, I hope not. For, for one thing, I don't smoke anymore. <laughs> but um, So anyway, I think, I think it would have been fun to paint those things uh, as, as weird as they were. And, this was the most nearly, this is the closest thing to what you guys might do.
Um, <laughs> this is pastel, and it's uh, it, I did this one mostly probably from with crayons, pastel crayons. Oh. Um, and I thought, well, it would be fun though to to make a cowboy that uh, would not be a John Wayne cowboy. He would he would have magic happen to him. Um, he would be participating in some kind of magic. And then now we're getting into music stuff, uh, or again maybe. Um, one of the first things, the, the sub theme is for a lot of this is, it's a hard job to get, to make a living in Albuquerque as an artist. Um, and you have to, you might have to do any number of things, teach, do construction. I know a guy that he's, he's sold internationally even, he does great big paintings, and he's still working construction. And his wife is a teacher. In fact, Iva, uh, it, uh, it's her husband. And, uh, he, but he still couldn't get away from that other job. But I, some of the first things that I did um, at all, I didn't, ha I didn't study um, um, illustration or design and just kind of fell into that. I did stuff for the jazz workshop because I met uh, Tom Brownick and, and we became friends right away and, and he needed some posters. This was the anniversary of the 35th year that I had done some posters for them. And it was, it was a rich experience the whole time. I got to meet my musical heroes. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just wonderful. And it, when he quit, when the Outpost Performance Space quit doing mostly jazz and blues, and they had a lot more concerts, I couldn't just do, a, I couldn't do a piece for every single concert because they had way too many. They might have two, two or three a week. So I had to come up with an umbrella image that would suggest they were doing now a lot more kinds of things. So I, I, I just made up the, the alphabet there. They're all like common alphabets, but I made my own versions of them. And uh, it's to suggest that there's a lot more going on there now than jazz and blues. Um, this is a piece I did. Another aspect of being an artist is line drawing, which I did a, a lot of, and this was for the newspaper when I was there. And they performed um, they were much influenced, they were out of St. Louis, I think, and they're much influenced by African music. And they appeared on stage with face paint and really colorful um, robes. He's got on a snap rim hat with the front part of the rim cut off, and, he, and, he, and then he put some kind of leather look, I mean, uh, fur looking stuff on top of that. But I thought it was a real funny image. And if you do blues, you got to do blues with the uh, bottle, bottleneck blues. And that's what that's about. They, they had a series of players that were just a bottleneck. And this one was a, um, a, a, an event in Santa Fe that was guys that came out of jazz, which came out of black music, but they had now moved into the, into the future, essentially. And that's what the, the antennas are all about. I love uh, Afri African music, by the way, and African art. Okay, this is a stipple technique, just drawing each individual dot. And it's Betty Carter, and she was just elegant. She was just an elegant. I think she's still alive, and I hope so, but she was just really elegant. Now I wanted to make the presentation, the poster, this is the poster that Kick was for the for the event. And I wanted to make it as elegant as she is. So I made the big black background and then just had her face there. Blind Lemon Jefferson, one of the earlier blues players from Texas, he was born blind and his perception of the world was through music. And that's why I decided to to put um, his eyes within guitars. And Muddy, the, the previous artist, that was done in pastel, by the way, the previous one. I don't know how to go backwards, but um, 
Let's do it. Well, anyway, line drawing. <laughs> um, this one, I did it in the newspaper, and it's about, now I'm, I'm going to forget again his name. Um, well, at any rate, he's a famous uh, uh, classical musician. Gustav Mahler? That's, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what an interesting face he had. And I, I wanted to do, I didn't want to do his face in a more literal way. And I wanted to do it in a way that technically was, would be kind of, has some surprises. And therefore I did it, part of it stipple, part of it has patterned stipple, part of it was done with a brush to keep it loose. And I thought, it ended up, I thought, well, being a really fun drawing. And it looks like him. <laughs> and this is, um, remind me, I'm having, I always, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, yeah. Uh, I've never been able to remember my uh, names. And um, one, I used to be really embarrassed about it, but I found out that if you were born an introvert, you will not remember names, unless you really work at it. And uh, I've tried, but I can't remember names, typically. But yeah, he, became, he went from being born a slave to being one of Abraham Lincoln's chief advisors. Can you imagine that? And he had to run away from his slave master. He had to knock him down and run away. And then even when you run away, they had dogs and they had crews working the swamps and, and back roads. And when, if they caught you and took you back, it was going to be bad for you, very bad. But he made it north. And um, then this was a, a, a jazz musician I really liked. He was born in Texas and he played a plastic alto saxophone. <laughs> and they really, all the other jazz people, people really dumped on him. For one thing, he was playing different than everybody else. Plus, he was playing a plastic saxophone, <laughs> of all things, and it was white. This was about when the media was just beginning to notice televangelists and how much money they were making. And this was Oral Roberts, and uh, he was be excuse me, being really successful even before the Crystal Palace level of success was going on. And the story <coughs> printed by the journal was about, about him uh, as one of the chief targets of that kind of, that kind of really good. This one I did for the journal as well, and it was about cockfighters. And we were one of the last states to make it illegal. And at one point when they were interviewing people. I saw. I think I saw this on TV though. Uh, we, we did a story. And they do make them wear those things like that. They're, they have a thing on the back of their leg that's bad enough, but they, they put these on and they, they cut the comb off so that, they, so that they can't attack the comb because it has a rich blood supply. And then they put these things on and they interviewed this lawyer who was a cop fighter himself and he's in defending it because he was the only cockfighter among he was the only only lawyer among cockfighters in New Mexico. He said, "Well, I don't know why you're getting so bothered uh, about it. They're not animals; they're foul." <laughs> he's a lawyer. This was about the issue was uh, when it was becoming big when it was just becoming big, it was probably in the 80s or 90s, the, the connection between money and the medical institutions, because their, their own uh, logo has two snakes, I think. But I thought, well, money, let's make it a money sign. I thought that worked really well. It still says that. And this was, I, I just loved doing this project. It was for, um, there's a, a man, he, he's died now, but his name was Marco. He, he, he went to one name. He had three names, but he went to one. And um, he used to sell stuff. He, the, these figures, 
he would carve them and sell them at the state fairgrounds when, when the state fairgrounds uh, flea market was interesting, when it was good. And he was just so fun. He would be, you'd see him behind his table and he'd be on his tiptoes like this, bouncing up and down. He was so excited. He was such a people person. He was such an extrovert. And he would, I wanted to adopt him. <laughs> My, I never knew, I didn't meet briefly one grandfather. Uh, I think he died when I was three years old. So I always wanted a grandfather. And they, they didn't have to be old enough to be my grandfather, but they could be a grandfather's substitute. And my, my siblings and I were always adopting somebody to be a grandfather. And he was so fun, and he had a great sense of humor. He was just fun to be around. Even if he didn't make artwork, he would have been fun to be around. He's a great storyteller. But all of his carvings were like this. And I had six of them, and they had a show at the Hispanic Cultural Center. And um, they used my six. When I got in touch with them, I saw an ad somewhere. I think I'm getting the signal that I should hurry up. But I saw an ad online, and it said, we're looking for uh, sculptures made by uh, Marco. And I called them up, and I was kind of sheepish. And I said, you know, I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but I got six. If you want to use them in the show, you can. And they said, oh, please bring them down. At that point, when I took my six, they had 39. Wow. When they had the show, they had 140. Wow. So a lot of people responded. And his, everybody, if you ever met him once, you, just, you became a fan. <coughs> and I, I really love folk art, and I love outsider art. This is Taj Mahal, famous... Uh, blues player, played guitar, banjo, uh, flutes, uh, real well known. He came back a couple of years ago and uh, he'd been here a number of times before but I did this image for his coming back and, and I, I printed out six of them I think, uh, one for him which I would sign and, and he could sign if he wanted to. I, I gave one to Tom Goralnik. That they, that they could use as a fundraiser. And I gave one to Tom, and, and I kept one, and he signed mine, and I signed it, of course. And, uh, it was just fun for me because he was, he was one of my favorite guys. And this was kind of a more generic, but strongly, that's weird. Oh, no, that's right. Um, uh, Day of the Dead. I love the Dead. The dead. Um, both Carol and I spent a fair amount of time in Mexico and loved Day of the Dead events there, especially there, because it's serious there. They have a light side too, and they have a commercial side that really kind of could put a bad face on Day of the Dead there because of it's commercial. But they also, it's a very solemn event. They, they get, they put an ofrenda in their homes and they leave things for family members that have died in respect and then they go to the cemetery and they stay there all night thinking about the people that, that, that have passed on. It's a beautiful ceremony. It's really beautiful. And when you're around people that, that, that are really, this, where it's really important to them, that you, pick, you pick that up. And one of my favorite uh, blues harp players, they call, in blues, the harmonica is called a harp of all things. A piece I did in the 70s, or 80s, I can't remember. Another piece, same period. I, I liked working with wood. Another piece from that time, collage, um, a lot of it's collage, and I used found stuff. I was uh, during that time I was often broke, and uh, I, I probably couldn't have afforded any expensive uh, art supplies, so I just found stuff, anything I could find, turned it into art, and I I liked that. I mean, you know, we get used to going to the art store and and, and ha having our. Um, billfold scan for, for for how much money we can spend. I mean, it's expensive. 
you can go to, typically you can go to a hardware store and buy a lot of the same things, not everything of course, not, not fine papers and all, but you can find the same thing at a hardware store for a third of the price. But anyway, two, that's my piece. The painting is not mine, but that's kind of a philosophic piece. And I, I love the word two because it suggests a transition from one thing to another, but it's not specific. And having been one of those people that never quite knew exactly, and, and it's real common, you go to art school and you get out and you think, well, now I'm gonna go make a fortune. Being, being an artist, well, it, usually it does not happen, and you spend a lot of time not knowing what the hell you're doing. <laughs> and uh, so this was a piece uh, that kind of welcomes you to sit down and think about it a little bit. <laughs> what am I doing? And this was, once again, a found piece. I found a big tarp. It was, it was a had been used to, to cover a, the load on a big flatbed truck and then it, part of it got worn out and they threw it away and I found it. It's rubberized. I love that piece. I love the, the tarp part. And then I made the, the wooden part uh, with the, the crazy painting and then uh, I decided it needed who knows, and I'm, I don't know that I could can explain it further than this. I just decided it needed a, a neon, around neon light. Of course it did. And then the, and it, and it would have been very symmetrical and less interesting, except for that yellow stick, which moves it into a slightly different realm. And, and I, I thought it was a lot more fun. This one I also cannot explain further. <laughs> And this one is eight feet by eight feet, and it's similar. And it's um, the dark piece down there at the bottom is a uh, an I beam, and it's very heavy. And the I beam, in spite of its weight, is almost kind of like floating. And it's on those four by sixes that people often put their painting, large paintings in their studio. They put them on those uh, pieces like that to give get, get it off the floor, so they're not painting. At the bottom, they're not painting their floor. But it, it's just about, like Jackson Pollock's paintings, in a way, it's about movement, it's about freedom, and that's what, what I was really enjoying that, that period, during that time. And, uh, yeah. In this similar piece, the, the two dark pieces are half inch thick rubber that it was probably used for a, for a conveyor belt or a belt for a gigantic machine that had, you know, parts this big and and the, it was maybe a belt for a machine like that. But I found it and I really liked it. And then I beams, I really liked. I really just liked the sculptural feeling of them and the look as well. And the plywood because it's totally unpretentious. And it's totally non quote non art, and I I really liked that, and uh, and then the yellow thing, I felt like it needed still needed something that would make it less somnolent, less um, um well, so I, I painted the panel yellow. I thought it was fun. And then <laughs> I did this piece. <laughs> It, it was during that time when I was s still doing my um, apprenticeship as a star starving artist, and um, it was downtown. The railroad tracks are somewhere back there, and uh, Carol and I were looking at the slide last night, wondering well, where is that? Because this looks familiar, but they could have moved all that. But the, it's so dystopian. It looks like after a World War or something. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that was during the 90s, I think, and when the world seemed to be coming apart. Um, the, the far right, they were going around killing people. They, there was a group called the Order. It was made seven people. They knew that they had to keep it really small, and they, the agreement in the, within the seven, group of seven was, if anybody rats to the FBI, you're dead. We'll kill you. 
And so they were going around killing people, and, and it, it just seemed like everything was coming apart. And I, I just put the chair up there between the barbed wire, and, and it just seemed right. Had to do with the times. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> We've got to, when you get to a point when things are not working, do something that's fun and where you can also learn at the same time. So I used to drive an early 55 Chevy truck, and every time I'd stop anywhere, somebody would stop and say, hey, my granddad's got a truck like that, or that's the truck I learned how to drive in. And, and I love those old trucks with their big smooth curves. And we have a friend that had this, it's the Studebaker. Here's from up his staircase, Studebaker trucks. They were real classics. Uh, Raymond Lowy that designed the streamlined trains, he's the one that designed Studebakers for a while. And they I just love them. I think they're really beautiful. This one, I, this one is worth a minute at least. You can see the little cabin. If you look carefully, there's a man standing there. This was on the West Mesa. And I saw the old truck in, in there was a driveway I could go into, and I went in there, and uh, I saw that there was a man there. It was a gravel bed. They had this little cabin. They said, I didn't ask him how much they paid him, but probably much less than minimum wage, probably the use of the little cabin there. No running water. He did have heat, because you can tell he's got a little smokestack. But, I mean, that's, that's pretty bare living. And uh, here's the man himself. Um, you can tell pretty high mileage. He's had a hard life. And uh, he was real interesting, but pretty quiet guy. But he let me take his picture. More Studebakers. They were the most interesting vehicles made for a, for a good while. Classics. <coughs> and then old trucks. Growing night, that man, he drove their trucks for a living. He drove this early 55 uh, as his own. Everybody loves Mack trucks. This was Santa Fe. They made these trucks. They only made a small number of them for farmers to sell vegetables. And they're real rare. And she was selling uh, vegetables that she grew on their farm. This is my truck at the um, Chile uh, um, Cemetery. And if you are interested in interesting looking cemeteries, that's one of the most interesting in the world. Really fun. For a while I was really into motorcycles and this, this was another guy I wanted to adopt as a grandfather. He was so <laughs> kind. People, they would come, they had a tiny little place and people would come from Chicago, from the West Coast. I guess they got covered in some motorcycle magazine, but Walt was always there. And he'd say, come on right in, have a, have a cup of coffee, have a beer in the refrigerator. So that's where they were on, a, on a Trisco. And this is the final one. Um, this was his tool bench. And, uh, they, but they knew, they'd been in business from the early 1900s. They knew everything about every, all Harley Davidsons and, and associated um, motorcycles. Anyway, so that's the last one. And, and, and now's the time to throw money. <laughs> but don't boo. I, I'm very sensitive. I'm an artist. <laughs> Thank you for, for putting up with me.